Well, well, um, good afternoon to all of you here, and welcome once more to Al Monticello. Uh, what a pleasant, uh, pleasant day it is. Happy Christmas tide. After all, uh, this day, uh, January the 5th, is old Christmas. Um, uh, part of the 12 days of Christmas, Christmas tide. I beg your pardon, you, you caught me unawares. Um, I was endeavoring in a particular pastime that I've been pursuing these last few years. Uh, and I think a subject that you all are interested in is one that has interested me for many, many years. And it's not disassociated with Christmas tide by any means. Whether we think of old Christmas, that is today, 12th night, January 5th, or Christmas, December 25th. I'm referring, of course, to the birth of Jesus. I'm referring furthermore to the subject of religion. Uh, may I remove my mask? I would not be so presumptuous otherwise. Thank you. Yes, citizens, uh, the subject that has been on many people's mind of late of course, is religion and my particular opinions upon it. I'm happy to say that uh, as a moderator for our conversation today, we have Ma Laura Michael Balderson uh, here at our Monticello. Laura will be moderating your questions, and uh, I look very much forward to those questions upon the subject of religion. And perhaps I should be cautious to say anything further uh, until firstly I hear your first question. Um, Ms. Balderson, our first question today. Mr. Jefferson, what was your religious upbringing and what were your own religious views in your early years? Well, um, I feel somewhat comfortable to speak upon that because um, I remember distinctly uh, being brought up in the Anglican faith. Uh, of course, all of us were for the most part here in the former colony of Virginia. Uh, we were not only governed by the monarchy of Great Britain, but we were also governed by the Church of England. So no matter what your personal religious opinion might be, or the fact that your family might have escaped certain persecutions that were engaged throughout many kingdoms of Europe, uh, here in the British colonies, you had to adhere uh, to the ecclesiastical laws uh, of the Church of England. They were associated with the civil authority. Uh, my father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, was a vestryman of the Church of England in St. Anne's Parish, Albemarle County. And uh, I was baptized in that church, as were my brothers and sisters. So I can tell you um, comfortably and distinctly, factually, that uh, I was brought up uh, a congregant in the Church of England. And my attentions uh, to religious observation were very much directed by those ecclesiastical laws. Well, Mr. Jefferson, did your views on religion change as you went to the College of William and Mary and then began your public career as a lawyer and statesman? And were there others who influenced your ideas? Oh, mercy. Well, that's quite a lot in one question, Ms. Balderson, but I shall try to answer it again uh, comfortably because uh, attending to the old, uh, well, the old Latin school that used to be conducted at Tuckahoe Plantation, uh, that is where my family went to live once my mother's cousin, William Randolph of Tuckahoe, passed away and left his children fatherless. Uh, my father, aforementioned Colonel Peter Jefferson, uh, was an executor of William Randolph's estate, and so he removed our family uh, from Shadwell Plantation, where I was born and grew up, uh, to reside at Tuckahoe, and that was my very first experience uh, in schooling. And it was conducted, if you will, in one of the outbuildings of Tuckahoe Plantation, the schoolhouse, as it was called, conducted by a minister of the Church of England, uh, the Reverend Douglas, William Douglas. Uh, that's where you learn not only our native tongue, reading, writing, a common arithmetic, ancient history, modern history, uh, but you also learned Latin and Greek. Though, as I remember, the Reverend Douglas was somewhat of a superficial Latinist. Uh, he had a very strong burr in his accent, a Scot, of course. So I learned Latin language with mispronunciation. And that was corrected, I'm happy to say, when later we moved back to Shadwell and I attended uh, Reverend Murray's Classical Academy. So as you well understand, Reverend Murray 
indicates that it was as well conducted by a minister of the Church of England, even though he was a Huguenot. M-A-U-R-Y, Murray, uh, did uh, hold uh, uh, the, the uh, um, position as a minister of the Church of England. So that continued same. Now, my father passed away at that time, 17 and 57, only 49 years old. And with great thanks, monies were in his estate that I could continue my education. And so I then went to the old Royal College of William and Mary. And further, comfortably so, that was an Anglican institution. In fact, the old Royal College of William and Mary was founded as a seminary for the Church of England. Uh, the School of Divinity, its first and foremost school, next to the grammar school. And then, of course, there was the Indian school, supported through the estate of Lord Brafferton, Brafferton Manor, though he had been deceased sometime, the income from that estate went to the Christianizing of the eldest sons of certain Indian tribes, the Matapanaya Panonke, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, I can't remember the others, that uh, were so uh, educated in a Christian fashion. I was enrolled in the School of Mathematics and Natural Philosophy. That was the highest curriculum in the former colony of Virginia. And there is where perhaps, and why not to remain so comforted, I had the good fortune to fall under the tutelage of one Dr. William Small. I have left a description of him uh, that I continue to refer in conversation as this moment will allow. He was a gentleman of good manners, an enlarged and a liberal mind, and a happy talent for communication. Perhaps more than any other, he fixed my destinies. And by that I mean, he provoked his students to be so bold to question everything, even the existence of our creator. Because as Dr. Small would imply, our creator would not want it any other way. He has created our minds free and free he desires it to remain. Uh, now you might recognize a certain passage in our statute of Virginia for religious freedom that follows very much that, uh, that same statement. Well, I dare say that began for me in my collegiate education. To begin to question, to begin to wonder about religion, to begin to wonder whether the Church of England uh, had the sole monopoly on religious opinion. Mr. Jefferson, Bridget is asking if you consider yourself a deist, and what would that mean to you? Hmm. Well, Bridget, yes, I am a deist. And what does it mean to me? Deism, that's the respect of uh, the, the great and omnipotent power in the universe, the great architect of universe, uh, the prime mover of all things, a belief in God, deism, a God. And in my opinion, it's never been in the less uh, one God. I am not of the ancient Roman opinion of many gods uh, presiding, no, uh, one God. Uh, deism may have many explanations. I have often felt that the Quakers perhaps have uh, one of the best explanations, and that is simply the divine in all things that there is the divine in every individual, uh, that God's work on earth must truly be our own. Uh, also, I may say, Bridget, you will find deism uh, to be the foundation uh, in the brotherhood of man. Yes, I am referring to the many lodges uh, throughout the world, nonetheless here in our nation. Will you talk to us a little bit about the religious principles in the founding documents of our nation, such as the Declaration of Independence from 1776 and your Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom from 1786? I would say that both our Declaration and the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom hold in kind the recognition of the laws of nature and nature's God. Uh, and those are, are laws that are regulated by the, the God of our universe. Uh, they are indeed inherent rights that are given to an individual, not by any government and not by any ruler. They are given to mankind, the family of man across this globe, by nature and nature's God. This is referred to in our declaration, particularly in um, the first two paragraphs. Uh, which, if you will, follows an ancient Roman law, the Justinian Code, that everyone is born free. And that means no less the illimitable freedom of the human mind. 
Now, our statute of Virginia for religious freedom secures the same, that we have the right to hold an opinion freely, to freely express our opinion, and that is nonetheless in matters of religion. Again, I reiterate what I mentioned earlier, uh, the influence of Dr. William Small, that our creator has created our minds free, and free he desires it to remain. Now, though the statute of Virginia for religious freedom is a law, it is wont to suggest that government attends solely to actions in rectifying and resolving. So our statute allows our mind to be free in any instance to corrupt our minds or to uh, coerce our minds or to force an individual to worship a religious opinion which they disbelieve or abhor or to force them to provide contributions of money to a religion that they disbelieve or abhor is illegal and can be attended to by law. But I think the most important thing about the statute of Virginia to re for religious freedom is the statement, the title. It's the bill for religious freedom. That means freedom for religion. As I have said, wherever there is freedom for religion, you will see the greatest civilizing of man. Mr. Jefferson, can you talk to us about the role that religion played in the controversy during the election of 1800 and what role that played in your uh, differences of opinion with Alexander Hamilton? Oh, mercy, I, I feared that that question might be coming along. Nothing could be more conducive to the corruption of religion than politics, in my opinion, my opinion. That's why I've always been opposed to politics in the pulpit and the pulpit in politics, because it is not religion if it is engaged by politics. And when you think of the centuries of coercion and bloodshed and hypocrisy that uh, have flowed from such collusion of politics and the pulpit, well, then you realize what an asylum our nation has been for so many uh, to come here and seek freedom for religion. This was nonetheless in the presidential elections of both 1796 and 1800, when those who became known as Federalists began to devise schemes, particularly the schemes of news writers, to denigrate an opposing candidate simply because of what they thought was their religious opinion. Oh, yes. Uh, the Gazette of the United States of America, a Federalist newspaper, or hurled heresies against me, that I was an infidel, if you will, corrupt. Uh, I'm not going to say that the anti-federalist press was any different. No, the Aurora was, was to look upon Adams as a monarchist in his religious opinions. And yes, Hamilton, of course, was writing in the newspapers to cast dispersions uh, upon those whom he felt were infidels and, and irreligious. So it had a great effect upon me and, and provoked me to wonder just exactly, what did Jesus say? And this was something that I became interested in during the 1790s when I read more and more the works written and published by Dr. Joseph Priestley. Dr. Priestley, of course, was a minister of the Church of England. But unfortunately, as he began to provide in his sermons an association between the pursuit of science and the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, that those teachings were to open the human mind with a regard for one's fellow man and how to improve the condition of mankind, well, many in his congregation disapproved. They felt it was heretical. They asked him to desist. Well, he proceeded on, even discovering, if you will, the laws of oxygen. And as a consequence, well, some in his congregation burned his house down to teach him a lesson. Well, he would not desist. Uh, and he continued on, and there was destruction even to his church. And so happily, thankfully, uh, he sought an asylum here in our nation. And I was able to meet him uh, in Philadelphia and have delightful conversations with him and began to decide, yes, exactly what did Jesus say? This needs to be pursued. And that caught my curiosity in the midst 
of all of that political turmoil and heresies that were printed in the newspapers. Oh, heavens, it was terrible. We'll never see anything like it again. Your next question. Mr. Jefferson, Deborah and Dave would like to know um, if you've studied world faiths and how you view other faiths. Well, Deborah and David, yes, I certainly have studied the faiths of, uh, of many peoples. Uh, I have studied the writings of Mohammed. I, I have a Quran. In fact, I will tell you that Mr. John Adams has a Quran, and I understand that his son Quincy has about two or three Qurans in various languages. You cannot help but become interested in religion and, and the spirit uh, that it employs in mankind, the family of man across the globe, without pursuing a reading of many of the world's divines. And this is one of the reasons why I have discovered in reading all of the world's religions, I've come to the conclusion that they simply hold in kind one great law and rule, and that is one should do unto others as they would desire to be done unto themselves and to love their neighbor as they ought love themselves. This is why our statute of Virginia for religious freedom, as I have written, protects the Jew, the Gentile, the Hindu, the Mohammed. It protects the infidel. My motto has always been rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And therefore, again, the laws of government to attend to actions and not opinions are ready uh, to disallow any coercion of an individual to furnish contributions of money uh, to a religious opinion in which they disbelieve entirely. Mr. Jefferson, you've said, um, quote, I am of a sect by myself as far as I know. So can you tell us about how your own religious views have evolved as you've grown older? Well, here we are. Here we are where it becomes a bit uh, uncomfortable for me. Uh, the fact that someone has recorded or has known that I have written, I consider myself a, a sect uh, unto me own. And that's why I worry whenever I write letters. Uh, and I, I write for posterity with the hope that the future, yes, will read it. But I'm very cautious. I'm very cautious when I have shared my opinions in the past with, with Dr. Priestley, aforementioned, and at present with John Adams. And until he passed away, lamentably, but a few years ago, Dr. Benjamin Rush of Philadelphia, I'm cautious that these letters might get out of hand and be read by someone else and be totally misunderstood. And to that end, yes, I will not deny, I am perhaps a sect unto myself and the various opinions that I have expressed uh, throughout my entire life that I have expressed here today. But in my own opinion, that certainly does not make me irreligious. It certainly does not suggest that I am without a concern for my fellow man or for improving the condition of mankind, making better this world. I will tell you it is known that I remain on the vestry of St. Anne's Parish where I was baptized. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, I have been, well, said to have written the prayer for our nation in the Episcopal prayer book. I helped to form the American Episcopal Church in the new Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, as the revolution began, all of our churches uh, went empty because we had severed our ties, not only with the monarchy of England, but with the Church of England. And remember, we supported the livelihood of ministers of the Church of England, but without that support any longer, well, there were very few remaining in the pulpits. Uh, and there uh, is the point of the matter. And further, that I am on the board of directors of the Virginia Bible Society for the distribution of Bibles westward to the natives should they choose uh, to peruse it. And I am a constant churchgoer. I, I attend to, well, gatherings down in the courthouse here in Charlottesville. I try to get back uh, to the church down near Scottsville that I attended as a young boy. So what does this say? What is the point? Well, it says that I continue with my obligations unto the church in which I was brought up, though no longer the Church of England, now the Episcopal Church. But then it also raises questions exactly of my own deep personal opinions. Well, I doubt I am alone. 
And that is why in conclusion to this question, I have written and said as well, I inquire of no person's religion, nor do I bother any with my own. For I believe that a person's religious opinion is solely between them and their maker. Where would they be the more free upon this globe than they are here in our nation to hold that opinion freely and freely express it? And I am very cautious to speak about religion or to write about it and never together, but when I'm in the company of people of reason, for I have always discovered when people of reason gather together to discuss religion, they will find more to agree upon than they ever find to disagree over. So, yes, I would end as a soup song that I do believe that reason plays a great part in the discussion upon matters of religion. Mr. Jefferson, Jack has heard that you have created your own Bible and would like to know how and why you did this. Well, um, Jack, um, I don't know how you've heard about that. Um, I, I can tell you um, that um, many years ago when we were referring, of course, to the presidential elections of 1796 and, and 1800, um, uh, shortly thereafter, when I was finally elected the third president of our nation, um, I began in, oh, it was about 18 uh, or two, uh, to, to write what I felt uh, should be titled, um, if you will, the philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth, the philosophy of Jesus. Now, that might seem somewhat uh, incongruent and uh, contradictory that there ought to be a philosophy, but yes, there certainly is. Christianity, uh, Jesus' preachings, his teachings are indeed a philosophy far, far more beneficial to the happiness, uh, safety, and health of an individual than, in my opinion, any of the ancient philosophers. Uh, I engaged this philosophy of Jesus by acquiring uh, two Bibles uh, in the Latin and the English, and then cutting out uh, of these Bibles what I believe to have been precisely the utterings of Jesus, precisely what he preached. And I, I pasted them down, a uh, column or page of Latin and, and English, and desired as well uh, to acquire another Bible so that I might add Greek. And then that, if you will, would give somewhat of a, well, a syllabus, in my opinion, of the philosophy of Jesus. Now, as I have grown older, as anyone who grows older, uh, begins to somewhat be the more interested in religion. Uh, we begin to wonder, very simply, what's next? Well, I can tell you one of the great differences between the ancient philosophers and Jesus of Nazareth, that I entered into that very first, the philosophy of Jesus, is the idea of an afterlife. Jesus assures us of this, that we will continue on and in a realm, in a spiritual world that is perhaps entirely unbeknownst to us now, but we have a, a flavor of that, a, a sense of that. Uh, I think also that, um, that Jesus purports distinctly that uh, there is but one God, that we should have a love for that God. He is seen in all things. And, uh, and in this respect, I think the idea of pursuing further a, um, uh, a um, scientific investigation, if you will, of the teachings and morals of Jesus of Nazareth uh, is beginning more to occupy uh, my autumn years. Mr. Jefferson, Bess asks if you have a favorite Bible verse. Do I have a favorite Bible verse? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. I think the beginning of that is want to help us better understand uh, the spirituality of Jesus and how we can separate civil authority uh, and ecclesiastical authority from one's own particular personal thoughts and personal concerns. I think the passage on, on love, John 13, if you will, uh, is to have a very influential aspect in our lives. But you see, no matter what you read, whatever passage in the Bible, and I believe we are speaking now, are we not, of the New Testament? I, I think we should simply assure ourselves in this regard for whatever is our favorite passage, that faith is not faith without believing. 
I have written that. Mr. Jefferson, how does religion influence uh, or reflect your opinions on slavery? There can be no incongruity if one is a, an individual devoted to religion and a spiritual recognition of God's influence in all living things. No less, of course, our unfortunate brothers who are enslaved throughout their entire lives. We all know well that slavery has been justified by a corruption of religion, that even the preachings and teachings of Jesus have been assumed by many to, to validate slavery, to condone slavery. Not a soul who believes in the teachings of Jesus, his influence in our lives, in my opinion, could possibly deny that nothing is so more assuredly written in the book of fate than these people ought to be free. That is in the laws of nature under nature's God. Lamentably, however, we are in the laws of man, are we not? Day to day, we are regulated by those laws. Our future is almost prescribed by those laws. I say almost, because most fortunate here in our nation, we have an opportunity to rectify that. The first nation to be founded upon principle, not upon monarchy or special privilege. And one of our founding principles is to make certain the laws of man might imitate the laws of nature. This may seem like an excuse for one who was born into this lamentable commerce of slavery who continues to harbor slaves, not only here at Monticello, but amongst my other farms. And that does not mean any the less that I continue to make efforts to bring it to an end, but I've written, I, I doubt I will live to see it. And I have written, I hope there is an exalted bench in heaven that awaits me uh, with respect to what I have done. But again, I hope that is not looked upon as an excuse. I've said this many times. History will be hard on me. They will be hard on our nation for continuing to know what we know in our heart and our conscience is unjust. Mr. Jefferson, Jan asks about whether enslaved people had freedom of religion as well. I can tell you, Jan, that yes, practiced amongst the enslaved here, I have noticed their own particular preachers, uh, their own gatherings in their cabins, uh, their opinions, if you will, expressed in the worship of Jesus and the worship of God. I, I freely have always welcomed this and will continue to do so. They are a people of great and sincere faith. And how happy I am for that to continue. Mr. Jefferson, you wrote in 1802 that the U.S. Constitution built, quote, a wall of separation between church and state. Can you tell us what you meant by that? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. That was actually something that I wrote in reply to a letter that I received from a coterie of Baptist preachers in Danbury, Connecticut. They wrote me soon after I took the oath of office to serve as our nation's third president whether indeed the constitution of our nation might supersede the constitution of Connecticut, which still recognized the Congregationalist church. Now, mind you, these were Baptist preachers. Well, I wrote back to assure them that yes, our U.S. constitution does supersede with that. They must bear with patience, if you will, until that might prove the law of the land, even in Connecticut. But I also wrote to assure them that no one more than myself would rather see a great wall of separation be built between church and state. Now, rightfully so, uh, that statement in those precise words is not in our Constitution, but it is expressed in our Constitution, both in the very First Amendment uh, at the beginning and even at the end. In the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And at the end, Article 6, I believe it's the third prayer paragraph, there shall be no religious test for office. So right there, at the beginning and the end, you see a separation between the ecclesiastical laws and the civil authority. And I emphasize that conjunction between. It is not a separation of church and state. 
This is a separation between church and state. It means something different. Uh, those who might use the idea of separation of church and state might very well cause political turmoil and heresy, uh, suggesting a separating of religion from our lives, from the lives of those we elect to office. But no, a separation between church and state suggests more liberty, more freedom, if you will, for the civil authority to attend to its duty, which is certainly not the dictation of one particular religious opinion over another. No, the only duty of any government and laws is simply to protect people from injury by one and the other. Otherwise, leave them free that they might pursue their own industry, their own improvement, and their improvement is assured in a separation between church and state with religious liberty, religious freedom, that all religions may continue freely in their duty, which is the administration of the soul and helping an individual to pursue good. Well, in founding the University of Virginia, you chose not to have a chapel or a professor of theology. Um, can you talk about why you took that uh, unusual position on the role of religion in education? Yes, thank you for recognizing that. I'm rather proud to state that our University of Virginia is the first university in the history of man founded non-secular. It's founded upon the illimitable freedom of the human mind. It is the first, and it is a university. It is not a college. It's not a collegiate curriculum, which is too often limited and too often parochial. No, if you will, a universal system of education grows with new frontiers of knowledge. It grows as we continue to pursue science. And while we're on that subject as well, I'm happy to say, lest we forget, that referring to our nation's constitution, another founding principle we should not ever, ever deny, is written into it as well. It is, if you will, Article 1, Section 8, that Congress shall encourage the pursuit of science and the arts. So this is why in establishing our university, let it follow what I learned as a young boy at the Old Road College of William and Mary from Dr. William Small, that our students will be provoked to be so bold to question everything, even the existence of our creator, because he would not have it any other way. This is freedom of conscience, true freedom of conscience. This is further enlightenment. This is education. And it helps us better understand the value of freedom for religion. That diversity is our greatest strength. And that will give us lifeblood to go into the future, happy knowing that we are devoted to pursuing truth. You can enter tomorrow without a fear, pursuing truth. Well, Mr. Jefferson, speaking of bold questioning, um, Anne would like to know more specifically, what is your view on Jesus? Again, Anne, I'm cautious. I am cautious as I made statement earlier for saying anything on religion, writing anything on religion, uh, and only amongst people of reason. My opinion of the teachings and preachings of Jesus of Nazareth are no less with the respect to his regard for reason, with a great respect to his regard to all mankind, that just as reason can be corrupted by idolatry, or by uh, superstition, so may the teachings and preachings of Jesus be corrupted by, um, well, too much philosophizing, if you, too many sophis sophisms, uh, neglecting, if you will, what is generally to be understood by the common man, by an individual anywhere. That is where Jesus succeeds. That is where he is truly divine, if we are to pr provide that word. Now, I presume you want to know whether I consider Jesus to be divine or, or is he rather just a great philosopher? Do you understand how cautious I am about answering this question? What it could mean, if you will, uh, for so many who want to hold their opinion happily and freely as they choose uh, upon that answer they feel in their hearts already? 
Perhaps that is why I consider myself a sect unto myself, but certainly have never considered myself irreligious. Well, Mr. Jefferson, you've been very forthcoming in our discussion today. Um, before we close today, do you have any reservations about being so free in this topic? And how do you think the future might interpret um, what you've said and written about religion? And here I have commented frequently about following truth, about proffering my opinion. Would I be any the less truthful? Would I be denying an opinion if I were not to fess up before you here right now to state that, that you discovered me early on while I continue to pursue investigating exactly what Jesus has said. I am again revisiting, if you will, the teachings and morals of Jesus, and you have found me here cutting out of six, six editions of the New Testament, Greek, Latin, Latin, French, French, English, two for each of those languages associated one and the other, cutting out what all eyewitnesses believe they actually heard Jesus preach, actually heard what he said. And I am not going to deny, I have not gone into the miracles, I have not gone into his resurrection. I will say this honestly, but I say with no less faith in wanting to understand the wisdom and the reason and the spirituality of what Jesus said, what he preached. You have caught me. I fess up. That is the fact. That is the truth. Now, what will the future say? Will they say, rather than I was simply preparing my own book, uh, referring to the teachings and morals of Jesus of Nazareth, or will they say that Mr. Jefferson has written his own Bible? One or the other could be used for political vitriol. But would that be the truth of the matter? Would that be the fact? Let the future decide. I can only say in conclusion what I said earlier. Faith is not faith without believing. I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson, and I dare say you all now know something of what I have been doing not, not even my closest correspondence, with the exception, perhaps, of Mr. Adams, the late Dr. Rush, and the very late and venerable Dr. Joseph Priestley, founder of what is known as the Unitarian religion, have already known. So I raise a final question to you all. Does this then make me a Unitarian rather than an Episcopalian. I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed and happy old Christmas.